Sonic to the art. It's 10 o'clock. Good evening. Free Britney signs in hand. Fans marched outside the Stanley Moss courthouse today. What do we want? Free Britney. They're hoping Britney Spears and the judge will hear them as lawyers went back to the courtroom in the battle over the control of the singer's finances and part of her personal life. Our conservatorship means that uh, the court appoints someone to manage an incapacitated person's affairs, personal and professional affairs. And that's what Britney has been under this conservatorship for the last 13 years, her father, Jamie, has been her designated conservator, and she's had enough. Uh, and she told the court uh, in, in some bombshell testimony yesterday uh, just exactly uh, how controlling he is. Uh, as you said, everything from birth control to medication, so heavily medicated, she claims, that she felt like she was drunk all the time. How could somebody make millions of dollars performing in Vegas, headlining her own show, you know, appearing on the X factor and and making albums and also qualify for this layer of protection which is usually meant for people who are incapable of making decisions in their own best interest i do come at this from the view that i've lost a dear friend uh, to suicide as a result of poor mental health and frankly i would have given anything for anybody to have stepped in legally to have taken control of him and his affairs at that time because he really needed it nobody did and it was too late what I don't understand in Britney's case is how this could have gone on for 13 years. I think if you go back to the beginning, I think she was uh, ambulance twice to hospital. There were grave concerns, I think, about her mental health at the time. But the fact that this, this order is still ongoing 13 years old, I mean, it's, it's, it smells to high heaven to me. You know, say your mother has Alzheimer's. That's mostly who this is meant for. A medical exam, we think, was, was done with her while she was in the hospital on under 5150, a medical health hold. And whatever that said, said she was incapable of hiring her own lawyer. So it's very, you know, it seems like a big conflict of interest there that her father, who was applying to be her conservator, could choose use a, a doctor to go and analyze her. Spears' conservatorship started in 2008 after a mental breakdown. It is an extreme legal arrangement granted for people who can no longer make their own decisions. In the years since, the pop star says it was abused. G claims she was drugged, forced to work, and even prevented from having more children. For 13 years, Jamie Spears controlled his daughter's estate and personal affairs. Britney says he abused his position. Jamie says he only acted in her best interest. When do we want it? It is official. The conservatorship of Britney Spears has been terminated. This is the moment they found out she is finally free. She's free! This is The Trust Race, a series about scandals and controversies that have impacted our trust in science. In this episode, we're looking at the Free Britney movement and the light it shines on how our societies care for people with mental health difficulties. As a scientist, I can tell you with incredible detail and accuracy about how an electron might behave while orbiting a nucleus. I can make predictions and I can test those with experiments. What I have to say in the matter could be relied upon you'd probably trust me. As a way of knowing, science works very well for situations like these. As well as being able to learn about the behaviour of particles, science has revolutionised how medicine is done, where again we can learn through experiments about how complex biological systems work, and we can even develop treatments for disease. Science as a way of knowing is far less certain when it comes to many other areas, like human behaviour or mental health. It's far harder here to tightly define phenomena and to measure them. And yet, the scientific approach tends to dominate how we conceptualize and often respond to these more human phenomena. It's not true that science has nothing to add here, but it certainly doesn't offer the full story. What happens when the science part of these complex issues is the piece that's most trusted? What happens when the scientific way of looking at a complex phenomena is used as the basis 
to take someone's human rights away. I spoke with Haley Moss, an attorney, author and autistic advocate who's passionate about neurodiversity and disability rights issues. She's written about the Britney Spears conservatorship and why it's a disability rights issue. Most people when it comes to Britney Spears are very familiar with her music career, that she was extremely popular in the late 90s and early 2000s. And at one point, she ended up having what appeared to be an episode of a mental breakdown, some form of distress. She shaved her head. She was very aggressive, seeming with the paparazzi. And folks were very concerned about her mental health. And when this all was happening, her father, Jamie Spears, was the one who got control of most of her life. And she was under what is known as a conservatorship. For those who aren't very familiar with the conservatorship or guardianship, depending on where you live, that's what it might also be called. It essentially takes away all of your legal rights or most of them and makes them transfer to another person who is the conservator, the guardian. And in some places, that means you can lose the right to vote. It means that you don't get to decide when you work, how you work. And in Brittany's case, and even as the details came out throughout 2021, we were figuring out that she wanted to have more children and she was forced to have reproductive health care to prevent her from having more children, that she was forced to work when she didn't want to, that she was even under certain hours that she could see her then boyfriend. And it seems horrifying when you put all these different details together. And that is also why a lot of fans we're thinking we aren't getting the Britney that we want. We want to hear more from her. There's something that seems very off here. And that kind of led to the fans being the ones who really spurred this interest in guardianship and conservatorship. But a lot of the times it's not just Britney. And that's the thing that I really like to bring into focus. It took 13 years for Britney Spears's legal ordeal with the guardianship and conservatorship system to come to an end, which doesn't leave a lot of hope for the rest of us. What has to happen for a court to award such a, a draconian uh, view, you might say? What, what has to happen here in court? The judge essentially has to find you incompetent to handle your affairs. That's pretty much the easiest thing. And a lot of the times, it's very easy to get that finding, which is what makes it so terrifying. A lot of the times this happens to people with intellectual and develop mental disabilities more so than folks who have psychiatric or mental health conditions. That happens an awful lot to people with things like Down syndrome or autism that a lot of young adults especially end up in this system and not because they're incompetent. A lot of them end up here because a lot of families are afraid of what happens when my child becomes an adult. And a lot of times the educators, service providers, financial planners, who it may be, says there's not really a lot of options for them. And the only option that they're usually referred to is this guardianship or conservatorship situation that a lot of folks in the legal community and those who are disability rights advocates and activists like myself that either see guardianship as something that needs to be completely done away with and overhauled or used for its intended purpose. And its intended purpose was a last resort if no other alternative does the job. And there are plenty of alternatives that can limit but not be restrictive until end all basically with a lengthy court fight. So maybe you don't know how to handle your benefits and you need someone from social security to be appointed to do that. Maybe you are incompetent for a certain amount of time and need someone to be making those major legal and financial decisions on your behalf. But if you regain confidence after, say, a hospital stay or something, you can take over your affairs. There's lots of different options, and we just immediately seem to default to guardianship, especially when it comes to young people and folks who have disabilities. So it's a rights issue. It really is. What are the consequences more generally, do you feel, of uh, courts being able to suspend people's rights in this way? The consequences are that it's very much something that we just accept. That's the scary part to me is that you don't always know who is under a guardianship. And even if you are under one, there's not an awful lot of oversight. So if you really wanted to look at these court hearings and transcripts and things like that, guardianship is often considered very private and a family matter. 
a lot of the times those transcripts, those court hearings are confidential. You can't just go search them out. So when we were hearing from Brittany about her ordeal, it was a really monumental thing is that, oh, we are understanding what this person has experienced. We actually know what she's saying and testifying in court. She has access to the legal system. And not only does she have access, but because Britney Spears is Britney Spears, and we all know pop stars are relatively pretty successful people, that she, of course, has the means to be able to have an attorney. And there were even hearings about who she would hire. It was kind of a mess. (laughs) But it really just shows how difficult it could be for most people. I guess people like her, um, they have power, in, well, in a limited way because they have resource. But I, I guess, you know, your work is pointing to the many other people that are in the situation who are not Britney Spears. So, like, what do you think can be learned from uh, from the experience in recent years? What, how can we respond more generally? That's a great question. And what I always tell people is, I know that there was a kind of movement that happened behind Britney Spears, and that was the Free Britney movement. But if this is something that continues to freak you out, that feels draconian, that just feels wrong, stay involved in the cause. And I say that primarily because this does affect plenty of people. The estimates that I had, I know aren't exactly reflective because we really don't know who is in a conservatorship or guardianship, but the AARP once stated in their documents that it was about 1.5 million American adults. That's a lot of people. And we have to think about those folks that we can't just say this is not okay for Britney Spears, but this is okay for my friend, relative, somebody else who has an intellectual disability. It's okay for my grandparents with dementia, that it's okay for some people, but not others. We can't do that. That when we're freeing somebody like Britney Spears and working on the cause and realizing that this system is inherently flawed, we have to realize it's flawed for everybody who don't have the same access, who doesn't have the same power, that doesn't have the same publicity. States, at least here in the U.S., they are taking some steps to hopefully reform guardianship just a little bit, that you might be seeing this alternative that I'm a very big fan of, known as supported decision-making. It's not restrictive. It basically puts the person with the disability in that decision-making driver's seat, essentially, and that they have people that support them around them to help make those decisions. But ultimately, even if someone is giving me trusted advice and guidance and wisdom, I am the one who can make that decision of, you know, this is how I'd rather spend my money, or this is how I'd like to work, or where I'd like to work, or I would like to buy a car, but I am someone who struggles with buying a car, for instance, that I can choose which supporters I can bring with me or who can speak on my behalf and advocate with me to finish that purchase, for instance. I always say buying a car because if you've ever bought a car, you know it's a very drawn out, weird process and it's there's negotiation and financing and it can be very overwhelming, especially for somebody with a disability. So having someone in your corner might be helpful. For instance, I know if I'm buying a car, I am still going to take my dad. So we use some form of this almost every day or in our major life decisions. If you've ever asked friends for advice, if you've ever taken somebody with you to buy a car or to sign a lease with the landlord, you've probably done some form of this decision-making, but that person's not the one who's deciding. When I talk about guardianship in the car context a lot, I say that if you're under a conservatorship, somebody else is picking the car, the color, the model, the make, and you have to bring it back to the garage with a certain amount of gas in the tank every single time. Can I go back to something you, 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 we talked about a little while ago and how, how the court makes these decisions? What expertise do they look to to inform their decision? That's a really good question. A lot of the time they look to the petitioner who is often the parent or concerned individual. It's usually a family member who applies for guardianship. It's not something that comes from strangers typically. So the family, a family member, a caregiver, or somebody else can basically file this petition and say that this person can can't care for themselves, they can't manage their own finances, and the judge takes that into consideration and can grant that person that guardianship, essentially. And some courts just make a disability diagnosis as point blank, that's good enough, which is also how I see a lot of people who don't belong in that system ending up in that system is 
I, and I say this as an autistic person too, that I see lots of autistic young adults who just because of that autism diagnosis that somehow they are unable to do it, even if they are perfectly capable of doing things on their own or that they want to do things on their own. It's what makes this system so unjust a lot is it doesn't often consider the person's wants and needs. But I also think when we talk about guardianship, we have to understand where family members are often coming from. A lot of the time, they're very concerned about their transition age, a young adult child's future, or what's going to happen when I'm gone. At the heart of this controversy is the tension between diagnosis as something used against people and something that gives access to accommodations and support. But And that's also why diagnoses are complicated, is it does open a lot of doors, especially for young people. It's access to services in school. It's access to pre-employment and employment services. If you need accommodations, sometimes that is the only way you would be considered a qualified individual is having that formal diagnosis of sorts. It just opens a lot of doors to receiving services and access and also protection from discrimination. Because if we don't know that you have a disability, how can we know you are actually being discriminated against? I know that seems kind of like an obvious question, but it really helps to illuminate the knowledge there, I guess, is, oh, okay, this is good. But yes, there are those drawbacks. I know every time I've disclosed personally or professionally, I never know what kind of reaction I'm going to get. I know there are folks who would love to help me. And I also know there are people who will treat me differently or assume I'm a little kid or that I'm not capable of the things that I am perfectly capable of. It's kind of this mental gymnastics when you are a person with a disability that you have to think, how are people going to treat me? Why are certain rights of mine potentially on the line just by being a disabled person? Freedom is a basic human right. For any of us to have our freedom curtailed, you'd imagine that the bar is set pretty high, that the people making this decision are experts, and that they're using measures that are valid, unbiased, and reliable. I spoke about this with Emma Farrell, an academic and author who's written about people's lived experiences of mental health difficulties. Well, one of the most fundamental and protected of our human rights is the right to liberty. It's enshrined in our constitution and protected with a whole range of legislation. There are a few, very, but a few instances in which a person might be deprived of their liberty. And one of these is if they have a mental disorder. So in this instance, a person may have their personal liberty suspended or restricted using a number of methods. So things like involuntary admission and detention, seclusion and restraint, restrictions on their movement and, and can be very tightly restricted. Compulsory medication is one we often hear about, tube feeding and the confiscation of all personal property, at least temporarily. So things like money, your, your phone, the stuff that you would use every day, even your clothes. So often people who are detained under the Mental Health Act and having everything removed from them, they'll just be left with a pair of pyjamas. The thing is that unlike physical illnesses is that there's no test or scan or objective measure for a mental disorder. Judgments about whether or not somebody has a mental disorder is based on a thing called phenomenological psychopathology, which is really descriptions of behaviours or symptoms uh, that are considered signs of, of abnormality. Uh, but the thing about this is that we know from things like birth cohort studies, so I'm thinking particularly of the Dunedin study, where they follow children born in Dunedin at a certain point in time in the 70s through their lives, is that by the time we reach our mid-40s, the vast majority of us, and, and in the Dunedin study case it was 86%, will meet the criteria for at least one major mental disorder, if not more. So if you think that that's the technica technically, the majority of us can meet the criteria for mental disorder. It's a surprise that more of us aren't concerned about this rationale for depriving people of their liberty. Most of us are, are really only a personal tragedy or a fortnight of sleepless nights or a homelessness crisis away from a mental health crisis. So like in 2020, for example, here in Ireland, almost two and a half thousand involuntary detentions were issued. That's more than six people every day whose right to liberty was curtailed or suspended under the Mental Health Act. So who makes the decision to detain people in these types of situations? Well, 
The justification for detention is that it's considered to be in the person's best interest. And, and this kind of judgment about whether or not it is in the person's interest is ideally made by a consultant psychiatrist uh, who's a medically trained doctor with particular expertise in mental disorders. Guardi or our police uh, can also detain people under the Mental Health Act and basically anyone, members of the public, your partners, your, your friends can make applications for detention under the Mental Health Act. But mostly it, it's police and doctors primarily, though it should really be doctors. In the Mental Health Act here in Ireland, for example, it's very explicit that it's the assessment of consultant psychiatrists but we know what happens in reality is that it's often um, police and then people who work in emergency departments and a whole range of other what's called authorised officers of the health service. What informs their decisions? What's the basis for what they're uh, deciding? The most two most kind of common justifications for detention are that the person is a risk to themselves or to others. And the second one is that they are deemed to lack capacity so that they're not in a position to make good decisions or judgments for themselves. Both of these are peppered with controversy, as I'm sure you can imagine. If we take the first one, for instance, which is the one that's probably most commonly used on the grounds that they're a risk to themselves or a risk to others. So assessing risk is very difficult. Often it comes down to the judgment of the consultant psychiatrist who or whoever is issuing the, the involuntary detention. But we know that we are all influenced by, our judgments are influenced by things like bias and prejudice, which are often unconscious. And we see patterns coming through in this. So, for example, we know that in the UK, if you're a black person, you're five times more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act than a white person. It's not that surprising, perhaps, that even expert decisions about human behaviour are subjective. There aren't the scientific certainties here that we might wish there were. In that uncomfortable reality, might we have to ask what lies beneath our societal view of people living with mental health difficulties? What influences do we need to become more aware of and critical of? And, and we're bombarded in the media about stories of tragedies, of you know, murders and, and people who, who are attributed to having mental illness. But we know that these are disproportionately covered, you know, fear cells and Realistically, people who struggle with their mental health are more likely to be the victims of crime than the perpetrators. In Ireland, we're particularly well positioned to know how an isolated tragedy, for example, can actually have enormous consequences for a disproportionate number of people. At one time in Ireland, we had more people per capita in psychiatric institutions than any other country in the world, facilitated by legislation that came off the back of a murder by what was called a deranged vagrant in the newspapers of the director of the Bank of Ireland way back in 1838. It ultimately led to what's known as the Dangerous Lunatics Act. The thing about this act was that a person could be admitted involuntarily, free of charge, for life, on the most spurious grounds, and it led to it being abused terribly by family members or anybody who wanted to get rid of somebody who was difficult or odd or strong-willed or just kind of troublesome. So by the 1950s, one in every 70 Irish adults was in a psychiatric institution. Well, I'm not a doctor, and in particular I'm not a psychiatrist, but I spent a long, long number of years living in the west of Ireland, and of what I speak, I have seen. One sees a lot of old bachelors and old maids living alone. They become odd. This may be somewhere connected with immigration also, because it's well known that the best immigrate, and then the weakest remain on, and they find themselves cut away from life. Actually, I know other reasons for people becoming uh, odd or insane. I saw people who, under the impact of powerful missionary speakers, developed certain complexes and became mad. I saw it happen in two counties in the west of Ireland. I know of four people to whom that happened. But I think also one could give another reason. A very bad Putin is supposed to have that effect. People tell you that. If Putin is, Putin is badly made, and if people drink a good deal of it, it has the effect of upsetting them mentally. Nevertheless, I think that immigration and loneliness has a great deal to do with it, and the fact that in many places in the West, there's no social life. 
what I think this does highlight is how fear and concern and views about risk and safety are, are often more paternalistic than scientific and highly vulnerable to misuse. Can you tell me, like, what's changed then since the 50s, where there was this peak in terms of the number of people that were institutionalised? What's driven the change to today? And are things getting better? It's been very slow in coming along and often, as so many uh, legislative reforms we see here in Ireland, they're kind of prompted by the EU or the UN. So first, there was a number of acts in the, the middle of the last century, but the one that's currently in place, the Mental Health Act 2001, was really about putting in more checks and balances. So it isn't so easy to, to remove an individual's liberty, that they have opportunities to have their voice heard in the process a little bit more, that detentions aren't as long, that there's people monitoring and checking the, the liberty of people who are detained under the Mental Health Act. But we know there's huge problems with this too. You know, it, it isn't a balanced, a fully balanced process. So the rights of somebody who's detained under the Mental Health Act in relation to the power of the profession that has the right to take the, their liberty away. The UN Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has really been trying to balance this power imbalance between people who are in positions of authority, whether it's psychiatrists or the justice system, and people with disabilities. And mental health comes in here too. And Ireland in particular has been very slow, if not absolutely dragging their heels in doing the, the things that we need to do to make sure that people who are vulnerable, who are detained under the Mental Health Act, have their rights supported. Power lies at the heart of this controversy. The majority of those whose rights are suspended have little of it. With the exception, perhaps, of Britney Spears. Her conservatorship is unusual because she is a celebrity. Her rights being suspended attracted attention. And it's important to remember that Britney Spears is a real person and that no one should have to go through things like this. But her case has started a wider conversation about mental health, disability and human rights. But I do hope that folks do take the work that I've done around Britney Spears and have thought about as something they can take forward is keep that energy going, not for the famous people, but for everybody else, because there are those 1.5 million plus adults who are under guardianships and conservatorships who aren't going to get that spotlight, who aren't going to get that mic, who aren't able to afford expensive lawyers and possibly even fight this system. And I know it also feels very quick to want to jump to abolish guardianship forever. And that's always the thing that I don't say, even though I would love to see some form of abolition, primarily because I don't think we're ready for it yet. We need to have good alternatives in place and not everyone does. And it's a very slow process to see even states having a supported decision-making bill become a law. Even here in Florida, where I live, we are still trying to get supported decision-making passed and it hasn't been successful, but other states have been successful. It mm. takes time. It seems like a politics thing at times, but I also like to remind people that no matter what side of the aisle you're on, this is something that doesn't really seem to discriminate too much. I have seen Democrats get really hyped up about this. I have seen Republicans get very hyped up about this. I have seen governors and politicians from both sides really want to do something about guardianship as a whole. So that's really exciting to me that disability rights has historically been both bipartisan and nonpartisan, and it's only very recently it did become partisan. So I'm hoping that people do take that energy forward, that they get involved with their jurisdictions, protection and advocacy organizations that are fighting the good fight, and that they also think about what this means for the people in their lives. So what's the best route to reform? Whose expertise should we follow? Honestly, one of the best things we could do and some of the best people to engage on this topic are people who have successfully gotten out of the conservatorship and guardianship system. And a lot of them are fighting this fight to end it because they've experienced it. They have successfully been able to fight it. They know what it's like from the inside. And those are the folks who should really be elevated and leading this, which is why I don't look at this as my entire, I want this to be my professional identity or the one cause that I'm fighting for. I don't have that lived experience. I have the experience of, I know this is something that could have very easily happened to me, but I'm not someone who 
experienced it. I'm not someone who had to fight it. I'm not someone who had to go to court for this reason. So listen and lead. That's the best thing that we could do is really give the mic to people who have been through a guardianship or are still fighting it. I also think when we are organizing around disability issues, it has to be accessible. If you're excluding people, we are doing something wrong. So we want this to be as genuinely inclusive and accessible, whether it's the language we use, where we meet, how we meet, all sorts of things like that. So I really just hope that people are excited and want to do the thing because we all deserve the ability to make decisions for ourselves that when we become adults, especially young people, that's the thing that most of them are excited about, that they get to take control of their lives, that they don't have to be home by a certain hour, that they don't have to listen to their parents or guardians or caregivers on literally everything. And imagine if that was suddenly taken away from you. That's not something that I think most adults would be very happy with. So that can almost be that driving Forces think about how this can easily happen to someone you know, or what it would be like to not have that independence or even not be aware of what gets taken away. I've heard stories of folks who will go through it and the parents and family members don't even realize that they just signed away their kids' right to vote. They thought they'd be helping their kids register to vote, not that they can't vote at all. Science as a way of understanding the world around us has been remarkably successful, especially in areas like medicine. And because of that success, we tend perhaps to see it as the ultimate or indeed the only way of knowing something. But what are the consequences of that? When it comes to complex issues like our mental health, we've seen how using science on its own might limit our capacity to respond. Complex issues like our mental health need complex responses. They need multidisciplinary approaches that are led by those with lived experiences. We need responses that respect and uphold the rights of the people most affected. The next episode will be the final episode of the season and we'll explore another complex issue, climate change. The Trust Race is supported by Peritia, an EU-funded project investigating public trust and expertise. Grant number 870883. eight three. This series is produced by Sean and Morris, and you can find me on Twitter at Shane D. Bergen. <laughs>